little church that I was growing up in that led up to Easter. It started all the way back at Lent. And um, so we did, um, you know, activities like we decorated together, we had meals together, we prayed together, we reflected together, we played games together and celebrated. It was really a joyous time, really most of the spring focusing on Easter. And when we got to the week before Easter, the activities really ramped up, beginning with Palm Sunday. And I can remember that that usually, what we usually did was, is before the, that Palm Sunday service, that the whole church would gather outside the actual doors of the church, and we'd have, they'd pass out palm branches. And um, right at 11 o'clock, they would fling the doors to the worship center open, and the choir would lead us in and singing a joyful song, and we would wave our palm branches. So it was really... I really liked it as a kid, and I said, I really liked Easter, but with all of that celebration and all of that memorialization and all of that, what I didn't get was the historical significance of what we call the Triumphal Entry or Palm Sunday. And so the, uh, as I was studying this, this, it was so fascinating to me that I want to spend our time, the bulk of our time at the beginning, really talking about what was really going on, what Jesus was doing, and why it was such a big deal. Now, who you who don't like history or don't like background and don't like a lot of cross-referencing, you're just going to hang with me through most of this lesson because it's going to be mostly about the fulfillment of God's promises and plans from the beginning of time that point us to the redemption that was coming on the cross in just a few days. And if you're thinking, hmm, Okay, um, I don't know if there's going to be any real takeaway. We'll get to that at the end. There is a takeaway, but um, it's all really contingent on stepping back for a minute and just marveling at Almighty God. And that's what I want us to do because some of the passages of Scripture, um, they're not to-do verses. They're not things that tell us to do, so we're not really in those verses. And we don't need to really push ourselves onto those verses and, and this is really one of them, that we just need to step back and see what we can learn about God and just marvel at him. And so what I want us to do is to do exactly what Isaiah 25, 9 says, and that is behold him. This is our God whom we waited that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. As we go through these passages, let's see the Lord here. Let's just look for him and at the end rejoice and be glad about our salvation uh, and how he perfectly planned, executed, preserved every single detail. Because God doesn't just do things sort of. He doesn't just get close. He plans down to the finest detail and if he said it, he's going to fulfill it and um, that ought to give us comfort. That ought to give us peace when we face things that are confusing to us to know that he's got all the details worked out, even when we kind of can't see how it's going to work out. And so what we're going to do is really, really simple. It's the words of a real familiar song to us, and that is I want us to turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. And hopefully the things of earth will go strangely dim in light of his glory and grace. And that's what Mark wants us to do in this passage, in these last six chapters that we're just uh, headed into, and uh, we're just going to marvel at Jesus. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, like he says in chapter 1, verse 1. So I hope after tonight you're not going to think about the Easter story the same again, and not just go through the familiar events when we're coming up to that in this spring, and uh, because there's so much more to learn, just, just a chronology of events here, and most of it is we're going to learn about the trustworthiness of God, and, but to understand that, we got to dig in to some prophecy and some history a little bit, and um, so we're up to the last half, last third of the Gospel of Mark, and we're all the way over here at the very, very end, the, at the triumphal entry there, and this, just the last third of Mark covers only seven days. The other two-thirds of Mark covers two and a half years, two and three quarters of a year. And it's a, this last part from chapters 11 through 16 is just going to cover these last seven days. It's like I know some of you ladies who are in BSF are also studying the Gospel of John. Well, John is the same way. He spends half of his letter covering only the last seven 
seven days of Jesus' life. And that's because they understood this is the crux. This is the most important part. Yes, teaching's important, miracles important, interactions are important, understanding exactly what happened is important, but this is it. The seven days from the triumphal entry into his ascension are the whole point. And so, uh, so you, if you uh, got here, you have, I want you to look at this chart to begin with, and you, they're on the back if you didn't get one, and this is the events of the Holy Week, and I thought this was a really good chart that I found online, and, and what it does is uh, has all of the events from all of the Gospels uh, in there. Now, Mark doesn't cover all of these, but I thought this was really helpful for grasping how the, the Holy Week unfolds, and so to have a... a so everything references to Passover, so that's the pink, Nisan 15, Nisan is the name of the month. The pink is Passover, so it kind of orients around there. But really what I want you to see here in this is how Jewish, the Jewish mind and how they understood the chronology of a day. Because really for us, a day begins when you wake up, right? After a sleep period, you wake up in the morning, that begins the day sunrise, basically, to uh, the next sunrise is a day. You know, now we know it really starts at midnight, but mostly we don't say it's a new day till I wake up in the morning, no matter what time that is, right? But that's not the way it was for Jewish people. They calculated a day, sunset to sunset, and that's why the moons are here. So if we look at um, Passover, we would say, we would say, this is, how we would calculate it up here. But they would say uh, Passover began Thursday night at sundown and went to Friday night at sundown. So that's really important to keep in mind so you can understand the calculation of how the week unfolds. And so the moons are overnight. That's just supposed to help you how, see how the days unfold. So, uh, so I want to start tonight in John 12 and look at that just to kind of orient where we are. And he says here, six days before Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So that go back to your, your chart there. So Passover's on Nisan 15. It says six days before then. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. So at Nisan 9, they, uh, uh, Jesus is hanging out at Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' his house. And uh, so then we look at, at another verse in John 12. He, then it says the next day. So that puts us on Nisan 10. And uh, now why is that important? Uh, that he enters into Jerusalem on Nisan 10. And so I've got to go back to the Old Testament for that. So in Exodus 12, 1 to 3, the Lord told Moses and said, it talks about the first month of the year, that's Nisan. He says, tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one to each household. It goes on in verse 5, the animals you must choose must be year old lambs without defect. Can take care of them to the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at Twilight. So according to this, every year at Passover, a lamb would be, was to be chosen by the father of each family and inspected for four days from the 10th to the 14th to see that it was without spot or blemish. And that is, well, you pick one that looks good. Well, now I'm going to have it in the house and look after it. Well, see if it's got a cough or if it limps or if it's got some weird thing happening to it. So you can inspect it for those four days to just make sure that it is without any kind of blemish. And uh, this day, Nisan 10, was called the Day of Lambs. Okay, and it was a huge deal that everybody would go pick out their Passover lamb. And so we're going to learn about more of that as we go along over the next few weeks. But the point here is that almost 1,500 years after that first Passover in Egypt, Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey on Nisan 10, the day called the Day of Lambs. Now, you see that beautiful symbolism right there? I mean, it's just as these families were going out to pick their spotless lamb, the spotless lamb was coming into Jerusalem on a donkey to be the ultimate sacrifice 
for our sins. So uh, remember John the Baptist's de uh, declaration? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And here he is entering the temple, the perfect spotless Lamb, once and for all offered right on the day where they're supposed to be getting their spotless lamb. So that's all important. So now let's move over to Mark. He says, as they approached Jerusalem on Nisan 10, came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Now we're going to stick here for a minute. And I want to, so you can understand what's happening here, why, where he comes in is included and why it's important. So it's a little bit of geography here. This is a map uh, with Bethpage and Bethany on it. And so last time we met Bartimaeus, right? And it, he was on the road to Jericho, which was Mark 10, 46, which is not shown on the map, but Jericho is back beyond Bethany from here. So Jesus came down the road from Jericho through Bethany, Bethpage and into Jerusalem and to the east side of the city. Now. Why is that important? Well, the gate through he through which he traveled was aptly called the East Gate. So we want to talk a little bit about what the East, East Gate is. It's first that he Jesus entered in it through it, and so that's, that's important. So in Jesus' day, there were eleven gates to the city, and uh, today there are only eight, and one of them has been closed up. So seven functional gates now. There's some cool prophecy here that I did not know about until I was studying this, but it's so exciting to me. I was really excited. So, um, so you, uh, problem, the first is we're going to talk about the scapegoat and the law of Moses. Now, you're probably familiar, like I just talked about with the Passover lamb, that, um, that you would pick out a lamb for a sin offering. And so, but there were other sin offerings in the law of Moses made for a variety of reasons. And sometimes you might bring a young bull. Sometimes you're told to bring a male goat, sometimes a female goat, a dove or a pigeon, even some flour or some things that you would bring as offerings for one reason or the other. But on the day of atonement, which is in the fall, Passover's in the spring, there's another ritual that had to do with sin. So on that day, the priest would pick two goats and uh, would, they were taken by the priest into the tabernacle or to the temple for the sins of the people. So, and according to Leviticus 16.10, they would cast lots. One of them would be slaughtered for the sins of the people for a, for a blood offering. The other one, called the scapegoat, this, that's where the term scapegoat comes from, uh, will be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and then sent into the wilderness that's as the scapegoat. So what ha would happen would be the, the, the priest would take his hands and would put his hands symbolically on the head of that goat and transfer the sins of the people onto that goat. And then they would lead it out of the Jerusalem and it would be sent out into the wilderness. And you might have guessed, according to uh, uh, tradition, the goat that carried away, the scapegoat that carried away the sins of the people exited through the east gate of Jerusalem, which, by the way, is where Jesus will exit from Jerusalem when he heads out to Calvary. Okay, so the, uh, the, e the, the uh, east gate is also figured pro prominently in the prophecy in Ezekiel about the glory of the Lord. Now, Ezekiel, if you've ever read it, is very confusing. <laughs> Sometimes a lot of imagery in there, a lot of prophecy. So we're not going to go into that specifically. Uh, but if you like prophecy and how God fulfills things right down to the, uh, the, the every little bit, then you're going to like this too. So, you know, the temple was constructed as the dwelling place of God for the Hebrews. And so he communed with them. He visited them. Probably know from when Solomon dedicated the temple that the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And you see that again in Isaiah 6, that the glory, the train of the Lord's robe fills the temple. Okay? So his glory would actually physically come into the temple. But by the time of Ezekiel, Israel is was in great idolatry, doing all kinds of stuff. And chapter 10 describes, with a lot of imagery, the declaration of God's judgment against, against Israel because of all this stuff that they were doing. And then some 500 years before the birth of Christ, with all kinds of wild descriptions and angelic creatures and wheels in the sky and noise and all kinds of stuff, 
it, that chapter uh, um, gives the step-by-step -step exit of the glory of God from Jerusalem. It's recorded in there. Look at what, what verses 18 and 19 say. And the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple, stopped above the cherubim, while I, Ezekiel, watched. The cherubim spread their wings, rose from the ground, and as they went, the wheels went with them. That's an a, a, a image in the sky. They stopped at the entrance to the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of God of Israel was above them. And so later in Israel, so this is the, the leaving of the glory of God from the temple. Later in Ezekiel, the return of the glory of God is prophesied. And as you guessed it, it's coming back through the east gate. And the man, that's the one giving him the prophecy, brought me to the gate facing east, and I saw the glory of God of Israel coming from the east. And so he's, the prophecy was, he's coming back through the east gate. So here we have in Mark, Jesus entering the east gate of the city. And you know that Jesus tells his disciples, if you have seen me, You've seen the Father, right? And Hebrews chapter 1 is really clear that the Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. So this is a fulfillment of the Ezekiel prophecy of the glory of God in Christ Jesus coming back into the temple through the east gate, just like it was written years and years and years, hundreds of years before and so now later we'll see uh, the Lord returning and all is his splendor and glory at the end of time but see this for what it is right now the glory of God in Christ the radiance of his glory as it says here returning through the east gate I mean I just love that right <laughs> it's so cool so the temple so what a little bit more here on Ezekiel so the temple and the gates and everything in, in uh, Israel was destroyed in 70 AD after the crucifixion and resurrection ascension of Christ. Uh, and so in 70 AD, it was all raised. I mean, like not one stone left on the other. It was just, just torn down. So the city was later rebuilt. The temple never was. And there were no walls around the city for almost 1,500 years. And um, that's tell a, a Muslim ruler conquered Jerusalem in the year, around the year 1500. His name was Suleiman the Magnificent, and he took over Jerusalem, and he rebuilt the, uh, the, the area, rebuilt the walls, because it was his area, he wanted it to be secure, so he rebuilt those walls, and so he didn't build 11 walls, he built eight, uh, eight, gate, I'm sorry, eight gates around the city walls, then only three years after the, the construction was finished, he sealed up one of them. And so that's the one he sealed up was the East Gate. And it was based on what he read in the prophecy of Ezekiel. The belief then and the belief now by Jews today is that Messiah will come through the East Gate and enter through that East Gate. And uh, so they were still waiting for Messiah because they rejected him. But they think that he's going to come back through that East Gate when he does show up. And so this guy, Suleiman the Magnificent, took this prophecy so seriously that he had that particular gate walled up to prevent Messiah from coming. If you go visit Jerusalem today, this is what the, what the East Gate looks like. Walled up all the way to the top, you can't get in there. So he also went further than that, and at his time, this is not there now, but he built a Muslim cemetery out right outside of these walls because he thought that that would be a deterrent of sorts for the precursor of the Messiah who was Elijah to come. Now he was, Elijah supposed to be the, a member of the priestly class. It was forbidden for him to go through a cemetery. So here this guy had the arrogance and pride to think I'm going to pull two fast ones on God. I'm going to wall up the gate, uh, wall up the gate and I'm going to put a cemetery out there to keep God from sending his Messiah. Sorry. <laughs> Too late by like 1,500 years and as if any human being could create a barrier for God if he wanted to do something. I mean, so right. Arrogant, right? Anyway, the point of bringing up all of that stuff is that his determined effort 
to keep Messiah from coming in and out of this gate and blocking it off was actually used, this is so cool, actually used by God to fulfill the last part of the prophecy of Ezekiel in chapter 44. Look at this. The man brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, the one facing east, and it was shut. The Lord said to me, this gate is to remain shut. It must not be opened. No one may enter through it. It is to remain shut because the Lord God of Israel has entered through it. Isn't that cool? Don't you just love that? I mean, the east gate is where the glory of God, God's glory, returned in Jesus Christ. And God said, shut it up. Close it up tight. The usefulness is done. He is here. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that beautiful how God fulfills every single detail of his word? I mean, I just got chills when, when I, uh, when I uh, read through that. But anyway, you just dwell on that and go back and read those things. But it's really cool. So that's verse 1 of Mark 11. <laughs> so I'm going a little bit faster now. But I just wanted to, wanted to uh, just marvel at how God takes care of everything that he's ever said. So Mark 11, 1 through 3, so they are in Jerusalem. Uh, and, and Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, and which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Tell them that the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. So they went and found the colt, just as he had told them. And... He said, uh, and they answered, Jesus had told them to come get it, and the people let it, let the colt go. And when they brought the colt to Jesus, they threw their cloaks over it, and he sat on it. Now, this is the whole scene here is a fulfillment of the prophecy from the Old Testament book of Zechariah. Some of you probably heard this before, Zechariah 9. Rejoice, O greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you. Righteous is Righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the bull of the donkey. So Jesus here is being really, really bold and publicly claiming and laying hold to his Messiahship. There is no mistaking what is happening here. In fact, in another one of the Gospels, the Pharisees recognize what's happening here. That is a fulfillment of this, this verse here and demand that he tell his followers to stop. And that's where Jesus says, if they stop, the rocks will cry out. So the word gentle and here uh, in Zechariah is sometimes translated meek or lowly. Uh, and a lot of people think that it's referring to the donkey, you know, not very impressive, not very important. That, that, that must be talking about that donkey there because we think of a donkey as kind of a lowly animal, right? And, uh, and but uh, a donkey being that symbol of meekness but in the Old Testament that's not the case that's not the way it, it was a donkey was looked at it was a kingly animal if you look at 2nd Samuel you see that donkeys are very the king's household to ride on in his first Kings that uh, David had Solomon his son get on his own mule and there he was to anoint him as king over Israel. So these were kingly animals. So now here's the imagery. So a king riding a war horse is one who has been engaged in battle. They're coming back from a battle. Now you see that in Revelation. Jesus is riding the white horse. He has got a sword in his hand. He's got a tattoo on his thigh. And he comes back as the conquering king at that point. But a king riding on a donkey had a different meaning. It wasn't less than it was a symbol of peace, that there isn't any war, that it was a declaration when the people saw the king coming in on a donkey, it gave us good news to them. There's not any war. Peace is about us, and you can rest. That's what it was telling the people when he came in on the donkey. Now, people who were greeting him were really excited about this. They would understand that. Uh, they didn't under, but they did not understand the kind of peace that Jesus was bringing, not peace by getting rid of Rome, but peace between humanity and God. And so moving on in Mark, Mark 11, those who went ahead of head and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in 
the highest. Now the word Hosanna in, in Hebrew translates literally to save please. Save please. And that's a quote from the Messianic song, O Lord save us, that would be one word, Hosanna, grant us success, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And this is one of a group of psalms uh, in the middle there that are called the Psalms of Ascent. That is to go up, ascent, to ascend. And these people would recite these psalms as they ascended to Jerusalem, specifically on the Passover here. And on Passover Eve, this one was one, be one that uh, was, was uh, recited at the time of the slaughtering of the Passover lamb. So these words from Psalm 18 not only confirm Jesus as, the, as Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice and as his Passover lamb, but recognized and, and acknowledged him as the source of their salvation. Now, of course, not salvation as we understand it through the letters of Paul, but they were looking for salvation, that is deliverance from Rome. Now, the crowds were so crazy excited about Jesus right now because the raising of Lazarus from the dead had just happened within uh, a, a few weeks, maybe three or four weeks before this. They were in a fervor over it. You can understand that, right? I mean, this is not something you're going to forget, right? So they were excited to see him, see what was going to ha happen next. And so they're reciting this psalm as they normally would, but this time they're lauding it toward Jesus. And they are expecting he is going to bring them deliverance from Rome, just like the Hebrews were delivered from Egypt. Now, incidentally, before we move on from this, Psalm 18, 19, and 20 refer to the east gate again open for me the gates of righteousness and i will enter and give thanks to the lord this is the gate of the lord through which righteousness may enter now don't you love that jesus coming through the great gate where righteousness enters it enters lots of energy lots of excitement just as jesus comes in you know that's not going to last within just a few days they're going to turn on him and so at the end of our section for today, we go back to Mark 11 to wrap up. Jesus enters Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. So Jesus comes into the temple with his all big fanfare, then he dismounts. And Mark, oh, only his gospel tells us this part, that he looked around, surveyed kind of what was going on there, and then left to go back to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus's house. And uh, so he clearly saw the corruption because the next day he's going to come back and clear the temple, if you're familiar with that story that we'll talk about next time. But he's, right now he's taking a mental survey of everything that's going on here. And what this tells us about Jesus is he's not reactionary. When he, come, when he comes back to drive the money changers out, he is not in a fit of rage like sometimes people portray that. He's not angry. He's not throwing, you know, you know, just responding out of emotion. He was purposeful. He was direct in addressing the corruption. And he takes a day to think about it. He uh, goes back. Certainly, you know, he prayed about it, asked God for his direction for the Father, from the Father. And then he comes back to straighten this all out. And, but the destruction that this is going to cause is probably the source of why people turned on him so quickly. So it's late. He leaves. He goes back outside Jerusalem and, and probably to you know, Lazarus' house again. And what began as an exciting entry ends very quietly with him going back when they started the previous day. So why well, taking all this time to look at all these details and talk about all of that prophecy and stuff and uh, the days of the week and all of that you might be seen gosh way too much detail uh, <laughs> to too tired to think about it on Wednesday night after work but it's important because it tells us about who God is and you've heard me to say it many 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 times the key most important question you ask whenever you read scripture the number one thing you ask is what do I learn from God about this uh, what do I learn about God from this? Sorry. What do I learn about God from this? And this is one of those passages that's very easy to blow right through. This is just a chronology of events. of just learning about what's going on. And skip thinking about what we learn about God. So, a couple of things just to take away as we wrap up. What do I learn about God from this? First, I learned that God is not random. 
He is not random at all. 1 Corinthians 14, 13 says he's not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. He's not haphazard. He doesn't forget things. He doesn't say one thing and do another. Uh, you can believe him. You can rely on him to do exactly what he says down to the detail of your life, just like he did with all of the stuff we looked at in the prophecy today. And when you feel like your life is scattered and uncertain and you feel like God's not paying any attention to you, that's not true. That is not true. That is a lie perpetrated by the enemy to cause you to doubt him. You can trust every single word in that book. And um, you can, if you're struggling today, you can also be confident that he has not forgotten you. Isaiah 49, 14, uh, 15 and 16 says, literally, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands, which we're going to see how that unfolds in just a few weeks. Uh, very graphically, not going to fail you, not going to forsake you, going to walk through every single dark valley. The God has number, who has numbered the hairs on your head and knows all the sparrows uh, is aware of every detail of your situation. And he is using your suffering, your pain, your weariness, your weakness, your frustration, your confusion in ways you cannot believe and cannot see at this moment if you will just trust him and follow. And lastly, as we wrap up this section of Mark, remember that God is trustworthy. And that's the big, big takeaway. Isaiah 26, 4 says, Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord your your God is an everlasting rock. If he said it, you can bank on it. It means wonderful things like the fulfillment of prophecy that we saw today, but it also means things like he perfectly accepts you. He removes all your transgressions from you. There's no condemnation on you, and he will be exalted among the nations. So as we're rolling up to another, uh, another election, don't worry. He runs and he rules. So don't worry and fret. Trust and believe. Even when you can't understand all the details, we trust the one who can. And as we end up today's lessons, we go back to where we started and just behold the Lord. This is our God for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. That is, look at him, behold him, see him, marvel at his preciseness, and then together and individually rejoice in his salvation. Amen? God, we just thank you that we can trust you and that when it looks like the details are scattered all over the floor at our feet, we know that you picked every single one up and that you know what to do from the beginning to the end. And that if we just follow you and do the next right thing that you lead us to do, that we will be in your will. And God, we just trust you. Uh, we are excited about how you preserved all of this, how you pulled it all together. God, help us learn something about you to stand back and marvel at you as we go through the next few weeks together looking at these last days of Christ's work here on earth and what he accomplished for us. And we pray in his mighty name, in the name of the strong Son of God, for it, it is in him that all things are complete. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. here tonight, so if she, you're in her group, just join another one and get to know some new people.